And a lot of us have uh, really been pummeled in the last year. Some of us have had a great year. But this year, we all can agree, has been very interesting. This has been a year where we have experienced things that uh, we didn't really see coming that much. But if you've been around this church for a while, you know that we always talk about that it's not so much what goes on in the world, it's more about what goes on in our heart. And when we're rooted and grounded in the Lord, then no matter what goes on outside of us, that we are stable. And so this was an opportunity for this year, uh, during this year, to be tested, to see where we are, to see where our faith is, to see what we're truly tr uh, trusting in. And so I thought as we move forward into another year, I wanted to really anchor us into the reality that if the Lord tarries and we're here in 2021 at, at the very end, what is actually going to be different in your life? Is there going to be anything different? And I, I want to ask you the question because I basically said the same thing last year, and here we are. I'm standing here. We're all here. And I said, what's going to be different this year or than this upcoming year? What's going to be different? And that's important because as we approach a new year, we have a, a new opportunity to experience the love and the power of God like never before. And that's what encourages me as I look forward to another year. And I like to look back and, and see all the things that the Lord has done. And as I look forward, and I know there's a, a thinking that we can have to where, well, when that clock strikes 12 a.m. on the last day of this year, and when it hits that, then this next year, everything's going to be perfect. COVID's going to be gone. Every, every, you know, every, the government's going to be stable. The world's going to be, but that's not the case. So what's going to be different next year, this time for you? And I want to talk about that this morning because I, I want to be able to look at something very tangible and real about what will, will actually really make a difference. I don't want to give us something where it's a, a pep talk where it's positive thinking, where I'm trying to like rah, rah, you know, get you amped up. I want to give you something real that I can say, if we embrace what the Bible says about what we're going to uh, look at this morning, if we will embrace that, our life will be dramatically different this time next year. Dramatically different this time next year. So let's take a look. It's in the book of Colossians. And what we're looking at is actually a prayer, one of the several prayers that the Apostle Paul gives. And we're going to, to look at this prayer, and we're calling this message the effective prayer for an epic new year. And, and Paul is praying for this group of people in Colossae, where a church is developed, a church is formed. And Paul is, is praying for them. But what's very interesting about this is what he says. We're going to start in verse 9. What he says in verse 9, he says, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease or we do not stop to pray for you and to ask for you. This is amazing. Because you, you might think, hey, these people in Colossae, these people in whom this church is forming, and, and, and these people that Paul is praying for, and it seems like he has a passion to pray, it, it seems like they really need prayer because they're not doing well. But when he says, for this reason, you see that in verse 9, he says, for this reason, this is why I'm praying for you. Look at Look at in verse 3. This is why he's praying for them. He's praying for them in verse 3. It says, We give thanks to God 
and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Wow, that sounds like they're doing pretty well. So here we, we also can get an idea of what the Lord looks at in a gathering or in a fellowship in a church of what he would deem, God himself would deem, something that is going well in God. I think that's important because when the standard or the measure of what a church should be doing and how well a church is doing is geared more towards worldly standards, then we will have a false understanding of what a healthy, thriving church is. And I say that especially in light of the Western culture, I would say the United States even type of church model. So what Paul is saying in this little church that just formed, he said he heard that they had faith in Jesus and love for one another. So that's something that, that God says, this is a great thing that a church should have in it. But then and look at, look at verse 5. He says the reason for that or because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. So he's saying the reason that they had faith and were conducting themselves among themselves within the body of Christ with faith and with love for one another is because their understanding of what the word of God said. So they were a word of God church. So this was a church that they would look into the scripture to figure out what they were doing wrong and what they were doing right. That they would look into the scripture and, and allow the scripture to be a, the authority in their life. And as, as they're doing that, they're being commended and, and they're learning about a hope beyond their here and now. And that's why they were able to endure whatever may come their way because they had a, a hope that extended beyond this world. And the reason that they had a hope that extended beyond this world is because of their understanding and devotion to the word of God. So in verse six, he says, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, speaking of the gospel and the truth, and it says, and is bringing forth fruit. So the word of God is producing spiritual qualities within this congregation. And he says, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in the truth. So as they heard the gospel and as they learned and, and studied, they, they understood that it was what God did for them, not what they do for God. And that created an enthusiasm, an excitement, a vibrancy in their life with God and with one another. And then in verse 7, it says, As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear, dear fellow servant, who, has, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, which also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So Paul is in prison. And Epaphras is telling Paul, hey, that, that group down in Colossae, man, they're on fire for the Lord. They love the Lord. They're trusting in God. Their hope is laid up in heaven, and they're reading and studying the scriptures to show themselves approved, and they have an uncharacteristic, unworldly love for one another the way they treat one another and interact with one another is, is so loving and it, it's astounding. It's amazing. And then we get to our text in verse 9 that we're looking at this morning. He says, for that reason, for the reason of how well they were doing, Paul's saying, 
I don't stop or I don't cease to pray for you and to ask. And then he goes on in, in the prayer we're going to kind of dissect. But what I want to pause and say here for a second, and the, the first point that I want to kind of uh, bring to our attention is that Paul was persistent in prayer. And he was not just persistent in prayer where, like sometimes we think they really need prayer. And we usually think somebody's doing really bad. We really need to pray for them. They're doing so bad. And that's correct. But we need to pray for people who are doing really well. And that's what he's saying. We need, to, and what he's saying is this. The, the people that we need to pray for the, uh, in this particular case are the ones that are doing really well. And it's not a prayer for the lukewarm. This is not a prayer for the lukewarm. This is not a, a prayer for the casual bystander. That's a different prayer. This is not a, a prayer that, that somebody would just be on fire for the Lord, that they would wake up, that they would get out of their rut or their funk. This is not a prayer for somebody who's lukewarm and just is, is a, more of a spectator and watching things happen, a person like that will be stuck in that year in and year out, year in and year out. And they won't, there, there needs to be a different prayer for that. That's a prayer where that person needs to be convicted of their sin and repent from that condition. The problem is, in the book of Revelation, it tells us that people who are lukewarm, meaning they're not completely cold, and they're not completely hot, they're in a condition where they will not recognize their condition. That's what lukewarm is. That's, that's the danger of being lukewarm. It's being in a condition where you don't recognize your condition. In other words, you, you think you're doing pretty well because you're slipping in a little Jesus here and there, sprinkling a little garnish, you know, garnish your life with Jesus instead of Jesus being your life. Big difference. But see, what, what Paul is saying, the people that I'm talking about are doing well. These are people who are on fire, and the key component to this, and what I'm going to say next, is maybe after a person is truly born again, one of the most important things that we need to understand and one of the important things that if this does not happen we will continue in a rut our whole christian life and it's this we're not truly surrendered to the lord that's the whole thing we will never improve we will never advance we will never grow we will live on past experiences or head knowledge. We will run on fumes, merely fumes, and we will not have a fresh and dynamic and vigorous relationship with God that freshens our life continually. And it's this one thing. We're not surrendered to the Lord. So we have to consider this morning and this may be the biggest part, I think, of everything that, that we're going to learn here this morning. This is what's going to make your next year the same or different. And it's if you are truly surrendered to the will of God. And see, this is what Paul is praying, and he's praying passionately, and he's not giving up. And they're, they're doing well, they're doing really good, and, and he's praying that they would do well and continue to do well. And he's understanding that there are certain temptations to the people that are doing well. Maybe those temptations are even greater than the person not doing well. Because the person that's doing well is the person that is a threat to the forces of darkness. The person 
that is doing well is a threat to Satan's realm, and that person is bringing light into darkness, and because of that, they will be tried and tested. And there's many people along the road of faith that have gone so far and stopped. And it's always the same. And I can say this by observation, by by personal experience, by being a pastor and watching how things go down, but also, most importantly, by the Word of God. It's always this thing. It's somebody who may have a time of excitement and they go to a passion conference and they're passionate for an hour and a half and then they have to face reality, the reality of their everyday life and and they understand that 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 hour and a half passion conference is not enough to help them walk out their faith every day and so they go on a roller coaster, they go hot and cold, up and down and really In reality, they're not surrendered to the Lord, but their Christian faith is much determined by how things are going in their life. When they're going well, they might be a little more inclined to be thankful to God. And then when things aren't going well, then, well, maybe I'll try something else and see if that works. But see, Paul's prayer wasn't for for those who weren't even at that point, but his prayer, and this is interesting, We need to to pray for those who are doing well because they face these tests and these temptations. And I want to encourage you first to know if you're doing well that there's going to be places along your journey that really, really test you, try you, strain your faith, and you're going to be tempted to want to do something to make yourself feel a little bit better but I want to encourage you to let the work of God do its work. Let patience, James says, have its perfect work. Don't escape the trial. Don't try to do things to uh, replace uh, the hurt or to fulfill the hurt or whatever in your life, but turn to Jesus because then you will maximize the trial by growing in your faith and obtaining the greatest thing that you can obtain, and that's intimacy and closeness with God, which will result in this strong, developed faith. Does that make sense? So this year, we're going to face these crossroads. And and first step today, if you are a Christian, if you're not, that's a whole nother thing. All this really doesn't apply to you at all. If you are a Christian, then the first step is to say, am I surrendered to the will of God? Fully and completely. But see, this is what he says next. This this is so layered with depth. I'm just going to do my best to try to explain it, but... So so here's the thing. There's one thing, if you want to sum this up, there's one thing... Really, there's one thing that Paul is praying for. Notice what he says next. He says, as he's praying for them that are doing well, he says, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That's the one thing, really, he's praying for. He's praying that they would be filled. And when he's talking about being filled, that means that it would be totally dominated and controlled by the will of God. That, that means that, uh, so we may say somebody is like filled with rage. What would we think? That would be something that they, they're not in control of their self anymore. Their rage is taking over, and rage is what is causing them to make their decisions. Uh, and a more positive way to look at that is Peter in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, therefore he boldly proclaimed the truth. And then a little later in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, Stephen was full of faith and filled with the Holy Spirit. He too, therefore, boldly proclaimed the truth of God. So what fills us, what, what Paul is saying here is, you're doing well, but I understand 
that as you continue in faith, as you continue to go uh, down this road of deeper and deeper, deeper intimacy and closeness with God, you will face these challenges. And so I'm praying for you that you'd be filled or completely dominated by the knowledge of the will of God. And I think now what we're doing is we're sort of moving our understanding of what's really important for a believer. See, what he's doing is saying it's not the behavior that we should be praying about. That's sometimes what we do with uh, friends, loved ones, church members that, that are, you know, they're in sin. They're doing things. We pray, Lord, help them. Help them stop doing drugs or help them stop doing this or that. In reality, what we're learning here is we need, need to pray that something would change on the inside. Because behavior is a direct result of what a person is on the inside. So he, he's saying, I'm praying, praying for you that you would be filled that there basically wouldn't be anything else left in you. It wouldn't be a combination of stuff. It, it wouldn't be a mixture. So, but, but every bit of you, every, every cell, every microscopic part of you, every bit of it, that, it, that would, it would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And that word knowledge is important because what it means is epigenosis or gnosko in the Greek Epi is an intensifier, and gnosko means knowledge, but it's not head knowledge, it's experiential knowledge. So what Paul is praying for these people that have submitted their lives to the Lord, in other words, they're in the game, right? They're just not watching people do things. They're in it. They're walking by faith, and they're trying to understand. They're trying to trust God for what he's going to do. And as he's praying, he's saying, Epi Gnosko, that, that I want you, while you're in this game, to have super knowledge. So the, the intensifier Epi is like if we, we put something like very strong or very powerful. It's like putting a qualifier, a descriptor on it to enhance the word. And what he's, what he's saying is, I want you, as you are involved in the game, as you have surrendered your will to the Lord, and now as you grow in that, as you participate in that, as you have taken personal responsibility for your personal relationship with God, you're not just watching other people do stuff that you yourself are saying, Lord, this is me and you. This is our relationship. And what he's saying, this is interesting because it, it kind of suggests that if we're involved in this, that we may miss things, we may make mistakes, we may stumble, we may be wrong in instances, but all of that is okay because as long as we're in the game and keeping moving forward in faith, that we learn from those things, we grow from those things, we develop from those things, and we have opportunities over and over again to surrender our will and walk by faith. And when we do that, now it's just this constant growth, constant development in the Lord. But that's what he's saying. It's a powerful statement that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will. In other words, controlled by the will of God in the word of God as taught by the spirit of God. This is all this full involvement that they, they weren't leaving anything out. And, and that's why this is so important. Because it really flies in the face of what we often can make of what it means to be a Christian when we take our clues from the world and not from the word of God. And so we sprinkle a little Jesus in our life, and that is not how we will end up next year in a place where we'll look back and say, isn't the Lord good? We'll just keep going on and on, like I said. But see, it starts 
with you and I just saying, Lord, I don't want to be filled with my selfish ambition. I don't want to be filled with my desires. I don't want to be filled with what I want. What he's saying is, Lord, I, I fully and completely only want what you want for my life. Isn't that powerful? Can we say that? Don't answer that, but this is what's going to make the difference. That's what's going to make the difference for you and I this year. But notice he now he starts to add on this. And he says, in, in all wisdom, in all wisdom, what that means is wisdom is the application of the knowledge. So he, he's saying when we surrender our will to the Lord, then we will have a desire for knowledge of God. And, and that'll be sort of a, a passion for us. And that, that passion will fuel our desire to get into the word of God, that the knowledge of God, it's hard to, to trust the goodness of God's will if we don't know what his will is. And so we're, we're in the word, we're reading the word, we're, we're gaining knowledge, but, but see, then there's this willingness to live out the knowledge. That's what wisdom is. That we come and say a study like this or in our one-year Bible or whatever, we're reading and, and we're looking, Lord, how should I apply this? What should I do with this? And what, what that's going to do is show us that there's going to be a conflict between what we want and what God wants. Conflict. And this, this is where it gets really good. When that conflict occurs, when there's something that ha that's hard, when there's something we say, I don't want to do this, and, and we get into our flesh, but yet we say, Lord, your will be done. Didn't Jesus do that? Didn't we just look at that? Your will be done. Jesus was in deep sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane, in, in anguish, and, and he said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, the cup of God's wrath that would be poured on him because of our sin. If it's possible, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's the thing. So when we understand this conflict, we have to know this conflict is going to determine our walk, or should I say, what we do with that conflict. And when we lay down ourself and say, Lord, your will be done, there is a powerful thing that happens especially when we don't want to, especially when it's hard, especially when it hurts, when it's difficult. We say, Lord, nevertheless, your will be done. And when we learn to do that, and when those attitudes start to creep into our life, it's because we trust and have confidence in God's goodness. See, if you don't trust, you don't have confidence in God's goodness, you're going to have a hard time surrendering your plans to him. But see, this is what the word of God does. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we see God's goodness. We trust in his goodness. So we're willing to lay down our life for him. And, and now we do that in wisdom. And he says, in all spiritual understanding. And what that means is now is he, he's saying, as he's praying that I want you to understand God's will and how it plays out and to seek that and to uh, look for areas in your life where you're not filled with God's will, but it's really your will. And you do that as you're living out your life practically by faith, you're learning, and then you're living out those things that you learn. And as you're doing that, then you're praying for spiritual understanding in other words that you'd be led and guided by the holy spirit and as you start to bring all these things together you understand that this this is the inward inside character and quality of a person now that is really being used and growing and has the potential 
to do amazing things for the Lord. But we can't step over that. And what happens a lot of times is we, we want the result, the blessing, the fruit, without being willing to surrender to the way that that happens. It doesn't happen unless we surrender to the will of God and let the will of God take place. But now watch him transition. Now watch in verse 10. So remember, this, the, the whole purpose of this prayer is God's will. And as he's praying that he, he's praying that, that God's will would just sort of immerse them, that they would be immersed in God's will. But now, now it actually does something. So this is the result of that. Look in verse 10. He says, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. So that's the whole point of it. So that, that's like the byproduct. This is the outward part. This is the behavior part, but we have no behavior unless we have the inward work of God in our heart. But see, when God is working because we have surrendered to him fully and completely, then what happens is these, these things happen or manifest themselves out of us. And it's interesting, he says that the outflowing or the manifestation of the work of God in a surrendered heart is that they would walk worthy of the Lord. That word worthy is very interesting. It means fitting. And that word fit or fitting comes from those scales that they would use to use that had two sides and they would, you know, if you wanted to make the weights balance, you'd have to have even weights, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? So you have to have the same weight on each side. And when he's saying walk worthy, what he's saying is the indwelling of Christ in the human heart. Think about that for a second. If you're a believer, you have Christ in you that Christ in you would be equal to Christ working through you. That's what he's saying. And the only way that can happen is to let him fully and completely do that by surrendering our will to him. So he's saying that this inner work of Christ, he's praying this inner work in their heart would be so amazing that what would happen out of their life would be equal to what's happening inside of them in their life. And that's what it means to walk worthy of the Lord. Walk the same as not interfering with or holding back the work of God. So that's one thing. So if you want to have a New Year's resolution, that's one thing. That would walk worthy of the Lord. But when we hear that word, it could really mess us up because none of us are worthy. But he is worthy, and when we get out of the way, his worthiness will work itself out. We just get to get caught up in all this working of God. But then the second thing he says, that we had walk worthy, and then that we'd be fully pleasing to him. Have you ever considered a New Year's resolution to start off the year and saying, Lord, I surrender my whole life to you, and I pray and ask that what is worked in me will be worked out of me equally. And Lord, that my life would be fully pleasing to you. When we have the value that God has placed, placed on those two things I just said, when that's what's important to us, then we will not be tied to situations and circumstances because as Paul said in Acts 20, 24, when he is facing death and people are saying, Paul, don't do that. He said, hey, I don't count my life dear to myself. What he's saying is, what do you mean don't go and, and be persecuted and killed 
for sharing the gospel. Why would I not do that? Because what you're doing, the people trying to stop him, are you're like holding on to your life like your life in this world is what's important. He says, I'm not holding on to me, myself, and I. What I'm doing is walking to please the Lord and honor the Lord. So I don't count my life dear to myself because he surrendered his life to God. So his life is now in God's hands. So he's completely free from fear, from disappointment, because whatever he's doing, if it's furthering God's will, and if God's will meant for him to suffer, then and he's writing this in prison, then glory be to God because he is trusting, even though he may not have understood it, he trusted in God's goodness. So he is trusting in God's goodness. And so he said, I don't hold on to my life. I'm not worried about me, myself, and I. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And because of that, I can run my race with joy. See, when we're holding on, steering our life, controlling our life, avoiding certain things and and making certain things happen, now we're in control of our life. And when we're in control of our life, then now we have to carry the burden of being in control of our life. And we are not designed to carry the burden of life. That's why there's so much stress. That's why so many people have so many problems with anxiety is because because we're carrying things that we should not be carrying. And Jesus said, my yoke is what? Light, my burden is easy. So one of the ways that we know we are surrendered to the Lord if our light, if our life is light. So some of you may have a goal of losing weight this year. I would encourage you to give your burden for the Lord, to the Lord and you'll lose a lot of weight already. For his burden's light. Just surrender it. And then all of a sudden, people say, did you lose weight? No, I just cast my cares on the Lord. And I look light now. Well, I saw you the other day. You just look all like heavy and burdened down. Well, I cast it to the Lord. Now I'm light. Now I'm just, I got a spring in my step. But see, that's the thing. We Being unsurrendered means we have to carry these things ourselves. Being surrendered means, hey, Lord, whatever you want, whatever your will is. And so when we, when we look at this, the way we know that we're in a good position is whatever matter or concern we have, that we would be right in the middle, meaning zeroed out as to whether it happens or not, as long as it's the Lord's will. If we're shaded one way or another, if we're like, oh, this has to happen. If it doesn't happen, I don't know what I'm going to do. And if things don't change, I'm not going to be. Well, now we're inserting our will in. But when we're like, Lord, I trust in your goodness. Your burden is light. Your yoke is easy. I'm going to let you do what you want. I'm free. And now I'm going to just watch and see what you're going to do. And as we watch and see what God does, we can say he makes everything beautiful in its time. And then he gets the glory just like you guys did. He gets the glory. But see, it has to be zeroed out. We have to be okay with the yes, okay with the no. If we're shaded one way or another, it's not God's will. We're getting our flesh in. We're carrying a burden. And now we're panicky, pressured, control, holding on. And and that's not where we want to be. And so he then says, being fruitful in every good work. And here's the cool thing. Increasing in the knowledge of God. This is amazing. So if we surrender our will to the Lord, our yoke is easy, our burden is light, we have joy because God is good and he's directing our life. We're trusting in what he's doing, not in ourselves. We're free. And as we're free, then God's working all these things out through our life that we can't even believe that he's doing that. Fruits being produced. We're pleasing him. We're walking equal to the work in our heart, and he's doing all of that. It's none of us, it's all by his grace. And then 
we're learning about God. This is one of the greatest things. We, we increase intimacy with him. A lot of people ask questions about, well, can I do this if I'm a Christian? And, you know, kind of usually it's, can I get, how close can I get to the line of sinning and still be okay? And my question or my answer is always, and for myself too, drinking's a thing like that. Can a Christian drink? Because I really like to drink and I don't want to give up my drinking. And that's really important to me. And the Bible, you know, God did a miracle in Cana and there's a lot of these things. A lot of times the Proverbs is not mentioned about the swirling wine and what it causes you to do. But here's the point. The Bible allows people to have liberty in the area of drinking but not to get drunk. The reason I don't drink, it's just not worth it to me. The Bible says be filled with the Spirit and not be drunk with wine. I don't know where the actual reading would be, where I'd actually go over the line. I don't want to risk that. And, and for me, here's the big thing. Here's my whole point. Drinking for me personally would affect my intimacy with the Lord. That's why I don't drink. I enjoy intimacy with the Lord better than a glass of wine or beer. But that's just me. That's why, because now God is so good, I can't even handle it. Drinking alcohol would not add a bit to my life. It, it would just take away from me personally. Because for me, it's about intimacy. It's about closeness with God. And that's, that's, I've learned that God is so good. I don't want to do anything to interfere with that. But see, the point is that he's saying that he's surrendered his life to God and, and he, he's praying for these people that they would keep going because they, they would have challenges and, and face op obstacles. And he, he's saying, man, I, I know what they're going to face, but I'm going to pray for them that the knowledge of the will of God would control them. And then as they are controlled by the knowledge of God, fruit would happen in their life. But then the kicker is they would know God more deeply and more intimately. And so we're almost finished. So look at verse 11. Effective prayer for an epic new year. It's going to involve persistence. And then it's just directed at this purpose. But Here's the amazing thing. There's power. There's power available, right? So if any of us are thinking, I don't know if I can do that, and I don't. The thing is, you don't have to do anything. It's God doing it through us. So watch what He says. So in verse ten, He says, "Strengthened." That means enabled, right? We don't live out the Christian life in our own strength and in our own power. God enables us to do that. So he, it says, strengthen, enabled with all might. That word might is miraculous power. So now we get a supernatural element coming in here. So the, think about this. The book of Romans talks about this. The power that rose Jesus from the dead, how, do you think that's pretty powerful? Pretty, seems, seems pretty powerful to me. That power is the same power a believer has residing in them to walk out the Christian life. To, to bring life instead of death, to walk in the newness of life. So we have to learn as a, a, as a body the power of the Holy Spirit. When we surrender to the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit works in us and through us, the Bible says it's like rivers or torrents of living water. Can you picture a powerful, powerful waterfall? Just picture that and say that's like these, the power of God working through the lives of believers. And it says, according to his glorious power. And then it's kind of one of these moments like, wait a second. It sounded good. And then he says, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Wait a second. You had me at power, but then this long suffering and patience, what that means is there's a certain attitude, he says, with joy. As we go through this process, of surrendering our will to God and the difficulties that come because of the conflict of our flesh in regards to that. And as we learn 
So we learn that God's way is better and we trust him as we, we do that, then there's this necessity for patience and long-suffering. And that means that, that we stay in the trial, we stay in the difficulty, we don't run and escape and, and try to make things easier. We stay there, we let hupomone, which is a Greek word for patience or endurance, we let hupomone have its perfect work so God can work through that trial to complete us to his end. And the whole attitude, this, and this is why we know this takes the Holy Spirit. As we go through the strains, the difficulties of life, when we surrender to the Lord, we're truly surrendered to him, then there's going to be a joy no matter what we face. That's what he says. And that joy that we have regardless of what we experience is what Jesus said that, that in the world we'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So what Jesus is saying is that I'm going to give you something that's supernatural that is not dependent on how things go in your life. They're not dependent on how things go in the world. I'm just going to give you this thing, and you're going to have it. It's called joy, and it's in the Holy Spirit, and it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And this joy is supernatural. And you know what's amazing that I've learned? I know many of you have too. The whole world could be caving in around you, but you're like, I'm okay. I'm actually inside. I have joy. I don't like what's going on, and I don't. You know, this is not fun, but man, there's something deeper in my heart that is a demonstration that God is in my heart, that I'm facing this trial or this catastrophe or difficulty, and I have actually have joy in my heart. That's supernatural. That can't be bought. That can't be earned. It can't be paid for. It's a blessing of the Lord that he gives us. And so we put this all together. I hold a whole another section, but we're going to finish here. If you want to um, go home and do a little homework, my last section was a couple verses up to 14, but it, I was going to talk about the, the privilege of effective prayer, meaning that, that only the believer actually has the privilege for everything that we have going on. But here's the thing. I just want to wrap it up with this. To bring this all together, bring it back to where we started, I, I sense the Apostle Paul, he knew, so he was experiencing what he was saying. And the Apostle Paul, he's in prison writing, and he had been tortured and been on the run in this world, had gone through so much, he had given up so much of his uh, career and his uh, life and his power and position, which he had in the world, gave all that up. And he said, "All nothing is a loss but for the surpassing greatness of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, knowing Jesus is better. Worshiping Jesus is better. If anything causes me difficulty in this world, it's just enhancing my relationship with Jesus, and it's better. And so we have a, a few more days of this year. Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows how things are going to shake out? But you know what? It really doesn't matter because it doesn't change God at all. He's the same. And not only is he the same, that he is working out his plan according to his purposes. He is sovereign over all these things that are going on. And so what he says to us, take heart. In this world, yeah, you'll have tri tribulation, but be of good cheer. So you see, he actually encourages us to have a joyful countenance because we are trusting in the goodness of the Lord. And because we know how good he is, we can say, Lord, your will be done. I lay myself down fully and completely. Lord, have your way in me. And we have this confidence. If you will pray this prayer, do you think he'll do that? Yeah, this is praying according to God's will. 
and according to God's word. And so he will do this. So, man, I can't wait to see you guys next year and see how this all works out. Even better, if the Lord takes us home before then, I'm up for that. But we know God is good and in control. So let's pray. Lord Jesus.